since last year, many African states have been involved in the conduct of elections. Indeed, many African states have been compliant to democratic political transitions. While periodic elections attest to political development and the major act to prevent democratic reversals, as posited by the Libras, elections in Africa have become ritualistic due to the manipulations of election results, intimidation of the opposition parties, and the absolute deniers of people's right to choose their leaders in a free and fair electioneering process. My name is Ade Oye Akiola. I'm the head of research and teaching at the Institute for Pan-African Thought and Conversation at the University of Johannesburg. Welcome to today's meeting, which have been organized by the Institute for Pan-African Thought and Conversation in collaboration with the Institute for the Future of Knowledge, both at the University of uh, Johannesburg. The meeting takes a critical reflection of the elections that have been conducted in countries such as Kenya, Nigeria, and Tunisia, and explores the possibilities of deepening representative democracy. The meeting also aims to offer a prophetic analysis of the forthcoming elections in Zimbabwe and South Africa. The events have been divided into two panels, which will run one after the other. There will also be an opportunity for our guests and participants to engage with our reputable panelists who have been carefully selected and the best in their respective academic, social society, and policy spaces. It is thus my pleasure to welcome the two chairs, uh, Professor Kabili Matlosa and Mr. Terry um, Selani and the six panelists who will soon be introduced by the two chairs. Please permit me to hand over to the chair of the first panel, Professor Kabele Matlosa, former director for political affairs of the uh, African Union Commission in Addis Ababa, is also a visiting professor at the Center for African Diplomacy and Leadership and the senior research fellow at the IPATC, both at the University of Johannesburg. Uh, professor Kabele, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Oye, uh, uh, our host uh, this afternoon. It's, it's really my pleasure to be part of this uh, important seminar this afternoon. And uh, I don't need to talk about myself. We have introduced myself adequately, and thank you for that. Uh, we will kick it off. We don't have a lot of time. Uh, the organizers have uh, already indicated to us the time constraints we have. So we'll kick it off uh, with the first panel. Uh, the first panel um, will uh, have um, uh, uh, three uh, speakers, uh, presenters. I just want to check that they are available. Uh, Ms. Cynthia uh, Mbamalu from Yaka, Africa. Welcome. And uh, Mr. Mohamed uh, Dia Hamani. Hamami. Uh, from Tunisia. Uh, let's confirm that he's around. And then Prof. Uh, Frederick Ogenga from Kenya, uh, uh, Center for Media, Democracy, Peace, and Security in Kenya. And uh, the colleague from uh, on, on, who will speak on Tunisia is based at Syracuse, I guess in, in the US, Syracuse University in the US. Uh, and, and also uh, uh, Madame uh, Cynthia uh, Yaka Africa in Nigeria. I'm not sure whether it's Lagos or well, Abuja, you let us know uh, where you are right now. Uh, so that, that, that's our panel. That's our panel. Let me just quickly, uh, because uh, we've been. Is uh, my audible? Am I audible? Yes, you are. Should I, uh, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, let, let me just uh, give uh, a, a, some brief remarks, basically bullet points, because we don't have a lot of time, to set the stage for the first panel. Uh, the first bullet point is that uh, OEA has set the stage for us. I want to build on that. Elections are a key ingredient of democracy. There's no doubt about it. Elections are a key ingredient of democracy. However, elections in an election, an election in and of itself, does not amount to democracy. So we have to distinguish between democracy and elections because uh, 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 democracy, elections can 
can make, make, promote democracy much the same way that they can shield autocracy. That's number one. Number two, according to the OEUC uh, uh, election calendar of this year, uh, the African Union Commission's uh, elections calendar, there are about 16 presidential and parliamentary elections planned for this year. So let's, let's do that. Three of the three countries we're going to discuss in this first panel, Kenya held its elections in August, 2022. And our colleague is going to speak to that in, in a short while. Tunisia held its first, it held its first parliamentary election, first round of parliamentary election in December, 2022, and its second round in January, 2023. Nigeria held its presidential and parliamentary and gubernatorial elections in February and March, 2023. Now, fourth bullet point is that all these elections took place within a particular context that I think should uh, inform our discussions. The first is uh, the COVID-19 aftermath because COVID-19 has had its own peculiar impact on democratization and elections in Africa. Two, the continuing Russia uh, uh, NATO war in Ukraine is a factor that we cannot uh, you know, uh, close our eyes on because it has impact on livelihoods and the extent to which people then uh, uh, view governance. Which leads to the third point. There is currently a rising popular discontent with governance on the continent, which manifests by way of protests, demonstrations. You saw one in South Africa uh, yesterday, uh, and uh, you saw a lot of, actually in all these countries that we we're going to discuss, the, the, at least the first three, we witnessed popular protests in Nigeria, in Tunisia, and in Kenya. So, so, so we need to actually uh, uh, zero in on that as, as a factor. Uh, now, this then also, uh, this is my last point, uh, 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 Oye. This then also helps us to understand that there is a declining public trust in governance institutions. And linked to the Afrobarometer Afro has done a lot of work on this. So I'm not really uh, uh, saying something that is new. There's public, it, there's the, the, the declining public trust in government institutions. Linked to the public trust decline, we are also witnessing loss of citizens' faith in elections. And this one is, is very interesting. The, the loss of uh, citizens' faith in elections is very interesting. Uh, I'm going to just end with with giving you an interesting statistical, you know, a, 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 this, you know a depiction of this, you know, a, 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 of this declining uh, citizens' faith in elections. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk of, uh, we'll, we'll look at it from the transitions, you know, a democratic transitions in the, in the 90s and then the, the last election. Now let's look at Kenya. Kenya, 1992, in terms of voter turnout, 1992 transitional election. The turnout, the voter turnout was 66.81%. That's Kenya. The latest election, 2022, last year, it, it dropped from 66.81% to 60, 64.77%. It dropped all the same, but not, not that uh, major, as you will see with the other two countries. Let's go to Tunisia. Tunisia uh, 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 elections of 994, just kind of transitional, uh, 994, 95. 0.47%. Then the latest one in 2023, uh, earlier this year, 11.40%, shocking. From 95.47% to 11.40%. Let's look at Nigeria. Nigeria, 1993, a transitional election, 38.90% voter turnout. This particular election uh, 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 this year, 2023, 26.71%. Now, this statistical uh, uh, information tells us volumes, tells us volumes about citizens' participation in the democratic processes and citizens' faith in election, which in my view is dwindling. With those remarks, let me call on my panelists. Uh, oh yeah, uh, 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 my panelists, uh, uh, three of them. Uh, how did I put my, my thing now? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, my, my apologies, my apologies. I've already introduced them. 
Uh, so I'm not going to repeat that so that we don't we save time. I'll, I'll call on uh, Madam Cynthia uh, Mbamalu, and, uh, 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 and then he will be followed by uh, Mohammed uh, Dia Hamani, Amami, and the, the last uh, panelist to be uh, Prof. Uh, Frederick o Ogenga. They, 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 they will be, in, so they, 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 their bios will be uh, shown on, on the screen. So I don't need to read that uh, to you, colleagues. Without further ado, uh, we allow me uh, 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 to call on uh, Madam uh, Cynthia uh, Mbamalu, and uh, all of you colleagues, uh, my panelists, uh, let's skip to, skip to the time. You have strictly 12 minutes. So I have my colleagues who will be assisting me to time, but I will also time with my own phone, but you can also time yourself. 12 minutes, uh, Madam Cynthia, off you go. Um, thank you and greetings from the Federal Capital Territory Abuja in Nigeria. Um, and I think it's, I would say it's um, a huge honor to be part of this conversation. Um, interestingly, Nigeria, we're still in our elections mood. We just concluded the subnational elections on Saturday, March 18th. Um, so that is the elections to elect the governors at the state level and the state legislators. We had our presidential elections February um, 18, the presidential and national parliament elections. Uh, and so, I mean, for the governorship elections, we still have elections that are yet to be concluded. Um, some of them were inconclusive. Uh, and, and it's interesting we're having this conversation now and just following the, um, the introduction that has been made already. Uh, and I think I'll, my reflections would focus on on five broad issues. Um, um, the first um, is the first, and um, for me, is the fact that um, the conduct of periodic elections does not equate democracy. It is the means um, to the means to an end. It's not the end in itself. And the second point um, for me is around declining trust in government and how that impacts quality of participation in the electoral process. And the third point for me is around electoral integrity and how that supports the development of democracy in, 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 in our country. Uh, and the fourth part for me is around the, um, the question around the, um, the youth question, um, especially because of the context of Africa, we keep talking around the um, burgeoning youth population and how that impacts on the process. And the fifth part for me is around electoral justice and how that inspires trust in the system. Uh, and perhaps I'll connect that to the issues around legitimacy. And so for this conversation um, today, I, I said that with the, the first point around elections was, does not equate um, democracy. And let's just use, use the Nigerian, or the content of periodic election does not equate um, the presence of democracy as a means to an end. Ahead of the presidential elections in Nigeria, um, we had this robust movement for an electoral reform post the 2019 general elections. And the movement led to the, um, to the passing into law of a new electoral act in 2022, which was signed by the president. And the act did provide specific innovation or prov uh, provisions um, that in itself, in itself was designed to inspire trust in the system, but guarantee transparency. So things around electoral technology, things around the powers to review results that were declared um, inconsistent with the law and um, to limit the influence of the court in the process, things around disability voting and things around um, financial independence for the electoral commission. These were important provisions that did inspire participation. So post the passage of the law, we had a lot of citizens who felt inspired and the engagement especially from the youth population was quite inspiring in the, in the process. However, getting to the elections, part of what we did observe in the process, which is why I said the elections do not equate the presence of democracy because democracy in itself is about participation, is about inclusion and representation. Now, in the pre-election phase, um, we saw situations where the political party primaries in themselves were were so exclusionary that it went to the highest bidder. So the cost of nomination closed up the space. And in Nigeria, to contest election, you need to ride or you need to contest on the platform of, platform of a political party. And so when you have political parties giving high cost of nominations, running into millions of naira, what this meant was that only those who had the big money bags behind them or only those who had huge sums of money could even contest in the primary level. It closed up the space and limited the options um, for participation. 
And that's one point. So the fact you're having product collection did not mean it was very inclusive or participatory. Now, the other thing we began to see in the pre-election space was a trend of electoral violence that in, that was that um, we further saw playing out on elections day, which resulted in the incidences of voter intimida intimidation and voter suppression on elections day. So you can imagine a campaign season where the campaign is driven by a um, campaign of calumny and hate speech especially um, hate speech driven based on religious and ethnic um, sentiments. And Nigeria is a multi-ethnic um, na nation and religious diverse, diverse nation. And so when it comes to campaigns, you see a lot of rhetorics around ethnic identity, religious identity, and that continued to play through with the rhetorics from the political class leading into the elections. And now, um, so if I want to bring this to the elections, the in context, um, on Charlie for the national elections that we had, part of our observation as an organization, we deployed observers. Now, part of what we had, um, we the part of what we had ex we had observed in the pre-election space was that the closed space for campaigns would affect how citizens engage the process, but that also issues around the quality of the process could either inspire trust. Or, or 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 limit participation in the process, and so on elections day, um, regardless of um, the new law that gave INEC the power, the electoral commission the powers to um, assess their funds on time to plan better. Yet the Nigerian elections recorded late commencement across board with poor um, logistics management. Now, logistics management in the sense that we had low polling units where some voters were not allowed to vote. Pulling it where elections in not vote, and even locations where um, the, the, the elections materials were insufficient. So you can imagine that you had um, the interests with the electoral law and its increase in participation. But then on elections day, you had voters who turned out but couldn't vote. You had locations where voting went on till um, early hours of the following day. People spent over 20 hours to vote. So that's one point. But now the, the conversation around the quality of the process became a major, a major issue because for the elect legal framework in elections in Nigeria, you have the electoral law, you have the guidelines, but you had situations where sections of the guidelines were um, set aside by the electoral commission on, on elections day, especially sections around resource management, which was empowered with the new innovation in the electoral arts and enabling the commission to electronically transmit results. But you had that particular section not applied and applicable. So immediately it created doubt on the process. So, I, I mean, you have, you, we had an elections, but in incidences where voters could not vote, not for any fault of theirs, but in the failure of the electoral commission to plan properly, and, and then coupled with locations where we had violence. So that 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 is that that would be um, the first point I have. The other point is around the declining trust and how it affects participation. Now, um, Nigeria sadly has re recorded low turnout, almost a declining turnout in voters with successive elections. 2019 presidential elections, voter turnout was at 35%. Now, there was um, um, an, a lot of effort to inspire trust in the process. And the expectation was that with the new law, with um, new um, um, oversight systems to checkmate malpractices, yes, that yes, you would yes, have. Sir. Yes. Sorry, my sister. We have uh, six minutes left. Yes, um, that you'd have more participation. Um, however, sorry. Yeah, however, what we did um, see, I mean, the process were first by the pre-elections phase, the quality of the campaigns and the challenges on, on elections day, we recorded lower turnout in this election. This elections recorded, recorded about 27% turnout of voters for the presidential elections. And now, um, so you had locations where you large number of voters couldn't get to vote because of the challenges with um, elections administration. But what this has done was the elections, if you follow the conversation where, was the fact that there was already the trust deficit. So regardless of the data from Afrobarometer, which showed that 71% of Nigerians trusted that elections was a credible way to elect leaders. But the data also showed that people did not trust the process to deliver credible elections or deliver or that their votes would count. So already the challenges experienced on elections day 
What it further did was created a level of disinterest amongst voters to even participate. So you had people who couldn't wait for the voting process to commence and they just went back home because of frustration or, um, waiting to get their voting and their votes to count. And post that elections, a lot of conversation has been on the fact that a lot of Nigerians do not trust the process and as are indicating their lack of interest to even participate and engage. Now, the question around electoral integrity is key for me because um, it's beyond just having periodic elections. If the quality does not guarantee that legitimate governments are elected, if the process itself does not guarantee that the votes count, it affects the engagement of citizens post the elections. And for the lessons from Nigeria, integrity of the process is critical in supporting the move for um, democracy in Nigeria. Increasingly, you have citizens questioning the process. And when you have a process that seems to lack transparency, it affects how Nigerians or how citizens engage the process. And we've seen this happen in the governorship election. So the elections of Saturday, March 18, for instance, post the presidential elections, recorded larger incidents of voter intimidation, locations where thugs just took over the process and voters um, were, we lost to voters to that process, lots of casualties and violence and intimidation. And what that basically has done was, is to question the outcome of elections in several states. So as I'm speaking, there are protests in different states in the country questioning the outcome of the elections in some of the states. And you can see that that level of grievance in itself affects even the legitimacy of the governors who were elected and the current president who was who is um, the current president elect. The third and the fourth and the fourth point for me is around the youth question, and I think it's a general question for the continent Africa. Um, increasingly, you are having a lot of young people losing interest in democracy. Lots of young people questioning the concept of democracy or even the value of their citizenship. And I and I believe that it begins with how the process is credible, how the process is inclusive to in ensure the voices of youth are represented, and. For me, this is a major threat. If young people begin to lose interest in democracy, or if young people begin to seek for alternatives to democracy, we could see trends of coup within the region, within the West African sub-region. And sadly, we had some of those countries where young people were celebrating the military takeover in those, in those, in those countries. And it raises the question around um, the value of democracy. If young people do not feel that democracy is delivering its dividends, we are increasingly seeing lower voter to announce lower participation in government and lower youth representation in government. And from the experience from Nigeria, if you have younger people questioning their concept of democracy, it creates a threat because if young people begin to take arms against the state, it becomes a more difficult issue to address. So for me, the youth question remains critical in how we um, solidify and consolidate on the supposed gains of democracy in our country. And the fifth point for me is around electoral justice. And, that, and how it impacts on political stability. And for me, electoral justice, um, it's in, I would look, connect that to the roles of the court. We're increasingly seeing the courts play an important role in our elections. If you follow the Kenyan elections last year, um, we saw the role the Supreme Court built, um, played in that elections and in delivering its judgment, and its emphasis on the sovereignty of the people of Kenya as paramount to any other political interest. And, and I think for the Nigerian experience, a major question around the independence of the judiciary, because now we have politicians who would, we, there's a common mantra now, politicians say you rig at the process and you go to court, because increasingly there's a trend of politicians buying their way through the courts and buying judgment. So now votes are not concluded or decided at the polling units, but concluded in court. And most times there is no guarantee on how the court Thank will you. determine the outcome. And if people do not feel that they achieve electoral justice, it also creates disaffection on how they engage the process. And I think that this is also a lesson from Nigeria, especially as a lot of the cases post these elections are currently in court. Most of the candidates and the oppositions are not um, are in court already, challenging the outcome at both the national and state level. And we're looking forward to see how the courts will determine the outcome um, of these particular elections. I'll see um, the floor now, and I hope we'll have more robust conversation. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. Excellent, my sister. I, I really appreciate the, 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 the very rich uh, input you've made. Uh, if we were in a, a, a physical seminar, I would have asked uh, the pa participants to give you 
a, you know, a, a round of applause, uh, really, frankly. A very rich discussion you have uh, shared with us. Very, five, very good five uh, key messages that, that will come back to you in discussion and also uh, uh, closing the session. Uh, let, allow me to then uh, call on, uh, th thanks Cynthia, you, you were spot on time, right on time. And then I'll, I'll request uh, the second speaker to please uh, 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 you know, follow the same footsteps of Cynthia in terms of uh, respecting the, the, the 12 minutes, please. Uh, 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 Mr. Uh, Hamami, please. So in, uh, in, I think in term to understand the uh, electoral dynamic, it's important to put it in the broader context, as uh, you said earlier. So um, most people think of Tunisia uh, as this country that faced what is often called the Arab Spring. So I wanted to introduce first to political scene quickly to people who are not um, familiar with it. So it's based on a highly networked, uh, but very fragmented uh, um, at the organizational level. At the individual level as well, it's highly connected. The military has been historically isolated, but during the, um, the last years, we saw the development of individual level connections with politicians who were in power um, since the fall of Ben Ali's regime in 2011. Uh, same thing, they are uh, embedded in the broader power network um, composed of corporate elites. Um, so since 2011, we had several, a large number of cabinets, uh, which reflects the type of political system that we had, the kind of more parliamentary uh, system. But what I think more important is that, uh, aside from the short experience of um, the Islamist-led coalition, uh, the old the we had an old regime coalition that uh, was in power uh, since uh, 20. 15 and that somehow is of disappointment for um for the Tunisian people who uh, did participate in the revolution to kind of make things change and so we saw as a result the decline of the president cabinet uh, trust gap as you can see in this chart people started having less and less trust in the executive but that also happened for the for the legislative um, so starting from the 2014 elections, we started seeing the rise of what we call the independent list, people who are not affiliated to any political parties because people were disillusioned by this kind of fact that is often thought as a facilitator of democratization that initially came from studies of uh, Latin American experience. Um, and then progressively, we saw the rise of other actors who tend to have a more populist and I'm by here populist meaning is neither ideological nor programmatic kind of agenda. Um, and simultaneously the situation, the economic situation became really bad. So if you just see these two indicators, the ability to get food or people running out of food without being able to, um, to get more, this is data from the Arab barometer. Tunisia had by 2019, half of the population were somehow in that situation. But the main concern of Tunisians since 2012, and using here, I'm using here the International Public Health Institute data, was mostly about job uh, creation of jobs. And none of the economic policies adopted since then, including those promoted by the World Bank and the IMF, um, were focusing on that top priority. And simultaneously, we also saw a decline in the satisfaction with the health system. So when the COVID crisis was at its peak and the number of deaths was very high, one of the highest um, in the continent uh, during in, uh, end of July, um, we saw uh, President Qais um, Saeed uh, declaring the suspension of uh, the parliament in what we often portray as a self coup, meaning a coup that is led by an incumbent president against the other branches of the parliament. And that was deemed by, and so this self coup was deemed by the um, African Courts of Human Rights and People, um, um, Human People's Rights, uh, as being uh, unconstitutional. Uh, but the President Kais I did not comply. Um, so, this is, but the problem is that the, the uh, perception of the economic situation. Uh, 
initially, right after the coup, it did increase. So we can see how there is a difference here between the evaluation of the current economic situation and the kind of optimism. Um, people are more optimistic about the next following two or three years. And now the two or three years are here and again, they um, overlap and, we, and economic situation actually went worse. Um, there was initially a, an important split between political parties uh, on whether or not to support the, uh, the coup and also to support the later uh, decision that was made by the president, which has to do with the suspension of the constitution and moving toward the new constitutional order. Um, and so the a few parties that um, supported it were more uh, radical and populist uh, coming from uh, marginal fringes of the uh, historical Tunisian left with the Arab nationalists and the um, and um, kind of old uh, Mar uh, Marxist Maoist uh, uh, political party. Um, in among the popular base of these parties, we also saw a split across these political parties. Even the uh, Shab, he one of the examples of the pro Sai pro uh, coup uh, parties. Um, half of the voters did not really support the, the coup. But an important point here that we should take in consideration is the importance of the rhetoric deployed in, in post-coup situation uh, to delegitimize the previous elections. So the perception of elections as being fair, free and fair is not only the result of the practice of election itself, but it's also the result of the way incumbents talk about them. So here in Afrobarometer that was conducted right, at, right before the coup, we saw a significant level of um, support. Uh, people, most Tunisians around um, uh, 80%, 75% uh, of Tunisians of deemed the elections of 2019 as free and fair. But in October, 2021, meaning uh, only um, three months after the coup, we saw a significant decline and rise of more skepticism and a total rejection of the elections being um, free or fair. And so Saeed now is presenting a new kind of political project that is based on what he called the local councils. Um, and uh, the problem that he's facing is the disengagement of people from the support of his party. So initially, he ran an online consultation um, on Muhammad? his political project. Yes. Yes, six minutes, please. Yes, I think I'll be able to finish before six minutes. Right. Um, right. So um, so when he ran an online consultation, he got only 5% of the Tunisian population um, participating. 30% showed up to the polls uh, about, about the new constitution. And, um, and in both rounds of the legislative election, we had one of the lowest um, uh, the rates of participation in post-World War II era with, with only 11%. Um, and with, when we look at the distribution as well, we see that geographical areas where there are mostly highly populated, um, where we find concentration of more educated Tunisians uh, for historical reasons and also uh, urbanization and others, uh, um, uh, relatively uh, high level of concentration, but people who were historically uh, uh, differentialized and and who and marginalized did not actually participate. The level of participation in the southern part and and in the interior region that is closer with Algeria was no more than uh, four percent, um, and with even like around one percent in the south. Uh, and those who were running in the new legislative elections um, were mostly between forty and fifty-four percent, which is also different than the much higher than the base of people who are in the 20s and 30s who did mobilize for Saeed in preparation for his coup and for his election in 2019. And this level of disengagement, we also see it through other um, indicators that don't have to do with showing to the polls, but even paying attention to the elections. And we can see that through the Google searches in comparison with the previous elections starting from 2011. And the media attention as well, as we can see in this graph, uh, the general election of 2019 or the municipal election, which is usually attracts more or less attention, 
um, at the media level attracted more attention than the referendum and the state of elections of 2022. So it's not only about um, being if, uh, um, a disinterest in uh, voting, but it's in disinterest in the political process at all because it's not seen as um, meaningful, let's say. And uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Mami, excellent uh, 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 presentation and very rich discussion as well. Prof, over to you. Uh, welcome. Karib Sana. Yes, Kavele, nice to see you, Prof. I remember nice the last time we met at the, okay. at the AU welcome. headquarters. Wonderful. Cheers. And then uh, oh. over to you. Uh, go ahead. And uh, 12 minutes, my brother, please. Okay, well, for lack of time, I'll just take you very quickly about what I want to talk about. I just basically want to talk about three very important issues as far as African democracy or democracies in Africa is concerned and it, its future predicament or prospects. One of those issues would be, of course, we're using the case of Kenya. Uh, one of those issues would be institutional designs for democracy. The other one would be elections and electoral infrastructure. And the last one would be the media, also related to institution, one of the institutions uh, that should be there to really uh, safeguard and promote democracy. But I'll first of all give you a brief history of Kenyan uh, democratic uh, journey. A Kenyan democratic journey, of course, has been characterized by periodic elections, which have been chaotic in a sense, chaotic in a way that uh, defines what the Kenya's political class has been, how the Kenyan political class has been positioning themselves vis-a-vis -vis the discourses that they use to consolidate power. And one of the things that come to the fore is actually ethnicity. So, so from 1991, when Kenya repealed Section 2A to usher in multi-party democracy, we've seen competitive politics with, with different parties coming up. But the only problem has been that uh, this journey has been littered with a competition that is based, based on ethnic allegiances. So, so, so there is on one side competition based on ethnic allegiances, and on the other side, design a, an institutional design, a system of governance that is not really favorable for multi-ethnic societies like Kenya. And this design is what would call a presidential system of governance. So this presidential system of governance, which some, some scholars will call it winner takes it all, has been actually uh, uh, a burden in, in the Kenyan political landscape. And we have witnessed a lot of violence because of this, uh, where those who lose elections really positions themselves as losers and uh, they perhaps cause chaos and violence because they feel not on the longer uh, part of, 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 uh, of Kenya as it were. So, so that has been a problem. And this is a problem that has been a challenge uh, over the years. And we saw increasingly Kenyans beginning to see how they can come up with an institutional design of democracy that can be favorable in multi-ethnic societies. In some quarters, they call it negotiated democracy. And negotiated democracy in Kenya has manifested itself through what we call, first of all, it was uh, the, uh, the national accord that was, that was mediated by Kofi Annan after Kenya went through a serious post-election violence in 2007, 2008, and brought in the position of the prime minister. Things became calm. In fact, in that era, that's when Kenya recorded almost double digit, digit growth in terms of the economy and things were, uh, were, were great. The only thing that happened later, there was a missed opportunity to institute this design that was brought out of the first handshake, you know, uh, that brought peace and stability. So having missed that opportunity, we saw a recurrence of violence, you know, we saw this uh, ethnic competition uh, postponed to 2013, we witnessed a lot of uh, uh, ethnic uh, aff affiliated parties uh, confronting each other and citizens fighting along party lines, but these are just et ethnic uh, 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 sentimental parties. Mm -hmm. And then we also witnessed that in two 2017, 
which led to the nullification of an election. But of course, we also saw Kenyans positioning themselves along ethnic lines. And therefore, post 2017 election, there was a serious discussion after that election was disputed and the opposition boycotted those elections on how Kenya should move forward uh, in terms of its governance or system of governance. And, and, and that brought about another handshake, uh, Katasi of Uru Kenyatta and Raila Odinga, and they agreed to come up with something called the Building Bridges Initiative, which was born out of consulting people in people's uh, assemblies. Of course, there was a battle to legalize this again, and it was debated in the county assemblies in Kenya, but it failed. Later on, it actually failed because they, uh, the, the court ruled that it was unconstitutional and a pre sitting president cannot institute uh, uh, constitutional uh, changes. So it was thrown out. And therefore, we find ourselves in 2022 with the same precarious situation where we see ethnic al al alliances. And again, we have this winner take it all, takes it all situation and another problematic election, which actually went to court and it was thrown away. So as we speak today, we are seeing the opposition going back to the streets because the streets have been used as those spaces where people ventilate uh, themselves in terms of the loser. You know, the losers are, have lost everything. They've lost uh, opportunities. They've lost their, they've lost their identity. They've lost their in inclusivity and, and, and all those things. So they feel helpless and hopeless in the context of what uh, the chair talked about earlier of a post COVID-19 situation and a problematic food security situation characterized by climate change and the war in Ukraine. So citizens are feeling this solution. So what should we do in this context? So my argument here is that uh, perhaps we need to give a chance and an opportunity for an African institutional design, which we are beginning to see through this model of the handshake. Because the handshake brings in, it's some sort of negotiated uh, concession, concessiato, uh democracy, where people come together and they agree, this is how we want to compete and this is how we want to govern. And this opportunity is always lost and then it always often leads to violence. So we have a, a situation like that today where we're beginning to see different voices, the clergy, the civil society, other political affiliations trying to encourage Raila Odinga and uh, William Ruto, who are actually friends. They've competed once in 2007, they were in the same camp to sit together and see how we want to move as, as Kenyans. But that is not the problem. So having missed an opportunity to come up with a good institutional design that can determine how Kenya will be managed uh, democratically going forward or governed, then we, we, we need to interrogate some of these institutions that are there to support democracy. And all these institutions have not been doing well. The judiciary has not been doing well, courtesy of the Supreme Court. Uh, the executive has not been doing well capturing the law enforcers uh, and, and other, other uh, support, democratic support systems. The electoral uh, agencies, IEBC, has not been doing well. And this has been the worst because this is where the competition is. So the IEBC, as a referee, has adopted a system that is born out of an, el an electronic system that is, that is a, a foreign system. And this uh -huh. system has failed in terms of how they want it to manifest in the Kenyan elections. And, and, and we, are, we are seeing, I, I, I still, do I still have time? Six minutes, yes. Yeah, so we are seeing uh, Kenya procuring, procuring a, a electoral integrated electoral management system, system that is supposed to identify voters and also transmit results. But the problem that this system has been infiltrated because it is, it is designed by foreign companies which have got an alliance with the, with the powers that be on the ground, the, one of the competitors in the elections. And this alliance has ensured that elections are not transparent. Uh, and, uh, and of course, there have been allegations of vote tampering and, and, uh, uh, and faulty vote, uh, I mean, uh, voter registers that are not accurate. And of course, this has related to contentious elections. So, so the argument is 
that is it, are we witnessing a situation where there's a democratic decay, where leaders are forced through our throat through electronic uh, uh, election mechanisms that are, are, are manufactured elsewhere and are used in Kenya for the sake of installing puppet regimes? And these regimes apparently would be those that speak the tunes of Western and other allies. Uh, and, and this has been a serious concern in Kenya, where we are now seeing ideas of LGBT coming in and creeping in through our judicial systems and being legalized or legit legitimatized at the expense of the cultures on the ground. We are also witnessing a situation where genetically modified organisms are being accepted in the country so that they can be so that they can Kenya could be one of those markets for 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 multinational companies that seek to sell genetically modified organisms to Kenyans at the expense of Kenyans uh, Kenyans health and and also at the expense of 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 our climate and our genetic uh, I mean our uh, indigenous uh, seeds so we are seeing a lot of these things coming in forcefully where people are disagreeing with those kinds of conversations. But, but again, those ones who are sitting in state house are seemingly entertaining these views. So is it that now today we have elections as just a, pro, a, a, a formality, a procedure that is a formality that is meant to hoodwink us that we are actually exercising our rights through the vote yet we are just being manipulated through systems that we don't know how they work. So what is the solution? Well, the solution is not far away. Part of it is to actually revert back to manual systems of voting. Because really, what, have, what we have witnessed as scholars in the, in the Kenyan elections is that they just use the electronic system to identify voters and to transmit results. Meanwhile, you are given physical ballots and you cast your votes and these ballots are counted physically. So if they would have a system where you, you vote manually and you devo devolve the electoral uh, body so that it's not centralized in one location in Nairobi because election results are manipulated when they are being transmitted through these systems that are born and are bought from, uh, uh, from foreigners. And, uh, and, uh, and of course, this is where things get manipulated. So if we devolve elections, for example, where I am, I'm speaking from Migori County, and you have an electoral uh, 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 body that will oversee elections in Migori County. So elections in Migori County from constituency level to parliamentary level to presidential level will be concluded at the grassroots level. And then this idea of transmitting results elsewhere would not be existing. And, and in that case, I think we can begin to have a very credible system of voting that will be reflective of, 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 of the views of, of the ordinary citizens. But as it is today, it's not the case. And finally, we are also seeing the media, the media presenting another complicated situation. And I'm not talking about the mainstream media alone. I'm even talking about social media today. Social media in Kenya has been increasingly used as an avenue for ethnic polarization misinformation, disinformation, fake news, and of course, at that spills offline and becomes another recipe for violence. So what is it that we can do about media spaces, both mainstream and social media spaces, so that the media can be used as one of those avenues that can speak uh, about the reforms that are necessary, especially during the electioneering time and post-election. And of course, generally, in terms of safeguarding the democratic space to, to ensure that, uh, that uh, democracy is manifesting itself in an organic and genuine manner and not a cosmetic manner uh, where we have leaders that we do not choose, yet they are there determining our lives and there's nothing we can do about it. Thank you, my brother. Thank you, Prof. Uh, excellent, Thank you. excellent, excellent, excellent. Actually, uh, you know, uh, we, we, have, we have come to the end of uh, I would like to thank our panelists. And uh, actually, there's a story that would summarize all the concerns raised by my three panelists. This story 
was shared to me by one of uh, African scholars, political economists, uh, the late uh, Tandikam Kandawire of Malawi. He said that, uh, you know, uh, elections elsewhere, they, they, they denote a moment for citizens, for, for people, for, for, for people, for or rather for voters to choose leaders. And then he said, this is the, 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 the conventional definition elsewhere. But in Africa, we have, uh, uh, we, have, we have twisted the definition. In Africa, instead of elections being a moment for voters to choose leaders, it is actually a moment for leaders to choose voters. So I think listening to all the presenters, that they are actually questioning uh, you know, the essence of elections to democracy and the extent to which uh, actually the leaders we get as a result of elections uh, are, 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 what do you call, are, are a choice of voters. This is why Kandawire then spoke, uh, uh, you know, at length about what he called choiceless democracies. Because it, it, during elections, it's the leaders that choose voters, not voters choosing leaders. The, the, this is how I'll summarize the, 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 the session, really, without any, any further ado. Uh, we'll we'll uh, get into uh, discussions uh, just now. Let me check my time. Uh, we, we are going to five minutes to four Southern African time. So we, 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 we have to go up until half past four. So which means we have like 40 minutes. Uh, to have discussions. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll ask uh, uh, my colleagues uh, to assist me to check on the hands that will go up. Uh, we, 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 we encourage, we encourage uh, our uh, uh, participants to uh, raise their hands and participate uh, you know, directly by raising your, your, your point and also put your, 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 your mic on as well as your video so that we can see you. But where you are unable to do that, please feel free to use the chat room to, 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 to put on your, your question and answer your chat room to, 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 to pose your questions. We'll be checking on the hands as well as the chat room as well uh, at the same time. Uh, so let me see if there's anything in the chat room uh, as I wait for hands. Okay, I see uh, uh, Francis Chadi. Yeah, I'm speaking uh, as someone who has witnessed a recent election. Yes, are you able to uh, put on your video or not? The network will be for- No problem at all, go ahead my brother, it's fine. So I'm speaking as someone who has witnessed the election in Nigeria. Francis, I was also yes. part of the voter. Go ahead. So the, the election participation in Nigeria recently has dropped because of the collation effect, which is one of the things that one of the presenters uh, hit on. At the local level, people are able to see that their votes are reflecting their, their position. But once it's moved to the next level of the summation, the tendency to have it manipulated is there. So I think it's, it's, it goes to show that the point that devolving the electoral process will be the way to go. Considering the fact that centralization is almost not going to fit the democratic uh, pattern of today, when we already have technology that can take care of the decentralization. So the reason for centralization was to manage costs. But now we are actually doing the inverse, centralizing when it is costing us more. So the, the suggestion would be to go the path of decentralizing. Decentralization. Uh, decentralizing and go for immediacy. Rather than the calling of the result for a uh, presidential election took some days because of this centralization. Fantastic. Very, very clear, my brother. And I think uh, that point actually uh, it echoes uh, the, 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 a similar uh, observation from Professor uh, Ogenga from Kenya. So I, we take your point. Decentralization of the entire electoral process to enhance the integrity of the process itself as well as the, the legitimacy of its outcomes. Next speaker. 
who is on the line? Uh, Pumi, are you able to assist me from that end? I'm not seeing yes, hands. Yes, uh, no, no raised hands at the moment, but we have no, quite no, a few right, right questions hand. in the chat box. Okay, let, let's check the question in the chat box. Any, anyone that comes up quickly? Okay, so we have one by Lerato who says, what would Prof, um, assuming he's referring to Prof Ogenga, envision this institutional design that mirrors the handshake looking like? What are its virtues and attributes? Uh, we have another from Shengi uh, may, I, may I request, sorry, sorry, may I request my panelists to please take notes of those questions? Yes, we'll, we'll should later. also be able yeah. to see the questions in the chat as in the, well. In the chat room, yes. yes. Go ahead. Uh, the next question from Shengiwe Dube says, please, uh, to all the panelists, please comment on the deployment of technology and achieving election integrity. I might be missing a few apologies, colleagues. Uh, we have a comment from Kenosi who says the reason to have declining elections or and declining trust is the hope from African people is that African people are not monitored and managed. Apologies, I think I might have mixed that up a bit. And then the last question from Dr. Aba says, thank you so much for the fascinating presentations. Um, and his question is, what is the best way of creating electoral integrity in Africa? Uh -huh. Excellent. Uh, so those are the questions. And then uh, uh, as we, we're waiting for hands, if we, don't, if we don't get hands, we'll go back to our panelists. But I wanted to just, uh, uh, since we have a bit of time, to, to just uh, you know, uh, uh, refresh our minds on the key messages that our panelists have raised, uh, 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 the three of them. Uh, starting with Cynthia, so that we can generate some more discussion uh, as, as, as uh, the, the, the colleagues uh, uh, are still uh, pondering on the questions they want to pose or, or comments they want to make. And by the way, we, we, we're, we're not just about to about the questions. You can also make a comment, please feel free. This is our meeting. Now, with Cynthia, Cynthia raised uh, five key points. One point that she uh, built on was around elections the, 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 the election democracy nexus. So the interface between elections and democracy, one. Two, she raised the question around declining public trust and dwindling voter turnout. Three, uh, she raised the point around electoral integrity, uh, in a big way, electoral integrity, uh, the integrity of the electoral process uh, which then also determines the legitimacy, the legitimacy of the outcome. Four, uh, she raised the question around the youth question, the youth, the youth in elections. And I think on that window, we can actually even open up the, 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 the envelope to, to, to talk about uh, other, you know, uh, uh, vulnerable and marginalized social groups, such as women, uh, people with disabilities, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that, that, that's an envelope that we can actually open up on the youth to, to include other social groups. The fifth and final point she raised, which also links to integrity again, is electoral justice. Electoral justice. So she raised those points. Uh, Hamami raised uh, very interesting and pertinent points also in the case of uh, Tunisia, historical role of the military. So the military has, has, has an important role to play in, in African politics. What, what is that role? Does that role enhance democracy or undermine democracy? One. Two, uh, he also raised the question like uh, Cynthia about declining public trust in government. Uh, three, the rights of independent candidates. Let, let's remember the, the, the current president came through that route of an independent candidate. He is a law professor, uh, uh, Kais uh, uh, Said. Uh, he's a law professor in a way, I, I'm not quite sure you'll know better whether he is actually linked to political establishments in, in, in the country. The, the fourth, is the rise of populist parties, uh, as it is, rise of populist parties. The other point, uh, uh, the economic situation and its impact on, on the economic situation and its impact on, on, the, on, the, on the governance system in, in the country. And you also raised the, the question around participation, the, 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 the low levels of participation uh, in the country. And you also showed us that, that uh, uh, table on participation you know, in, in the referendum, in the election, which was a very interesting, uh, 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 demonstration. Now, the question 
uh, and you also uh, remind us of the impact of COVID-19. Now, the question that we need to ponder is whether what's going on in Tunisia since Kais took over, is, is, is that, does that enhance democratization or undermine democratization, building you know, a, 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 a foundation for autocracy? That, that's, that's the question that I think we need to, to, to ponder. Uh, Prof. Ganga uh, raised the uh, interesting issues around three clusters. One cluster was on institutional design, questioning the, the current design, the winner take all system, presidential design, that, that is, it, it, it's not suitable for a multi-ethnic uh, society like Kenya. And I think she has, an he has an important point. And then he made a proposal that maybe to address this, we need to go consultational democracy route. And uh, how he calls negotiated democracy. That, that's consultationalism. So that, that, then, then Kenya could you know, uh, try around that idea of power sharing arrangements, coalition governments, you know, a, a, a negotiated settlements. So that's, that's one set of discussion that, that he introduced. And then he also uh, 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 said, maybe the handshake, the Raila uh, Uhuru handshake, golden handshake, could be one model to, to, to think around. The second, he spoke about electoral infrastructure, that maybe even the electoral system, the design, it needs to be revisited. This first past the post, when I take all the electoral system, is not saving Kenya, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, favorably. Uh, maybe there is need to move towards a proportional system of sorts, so that you you address the multi-ethnic, you know, uh, 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 complexion of, of 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 the society. Finally, he zeroed in on the media, and this is again another important. Well, before the media, technology. The technology, he raised an important point, and I think uh, this is a, a pertinent point, not only for Kenya, but for the entire continent. Technology is now becoming the voter in Africa. Technology is replacing the voter in determining outcome of elections. How, what, how do, what do we do about this? Frankly, people are being dis disempowered by technology, which has its own interests uh, embedded in, 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 the, in those that supply it from abroad. How do we handle this? It's, it's enough that the technology is become part of part of the regime change schemes in Africa. It's, it's a fact. So we need to, to confront this. And then he talked about the media, both uh, traditional and social media. That uh, this media, if they are not uh, responsible enough, they are able to fan electoral violence, you know, uh, through misinformation, disinformation, fake news, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these are the, the, the my panelists really. This is what they did. And I wanted just to thank them and, and summarize uh, in a nutshell what they've shared with us since I, I'm still waiting for hands. And then uh, call on hands uh, to, to intervene. Uh, let, let's have hands. And then my panelists, don't, don't uh, hurry to come in. Uh, we'll, we'll give you the last uh, bite at the end of uh, the discussions. Uh, let me know if there are hands. I can see one. Yes, we have one. Yes. And another one as well. We have two. I think this will be the Can second question hand? from Francis. Yes, let's take, let's take the hand, please. Yes, who is it? Francis Chadi. Francis, you just spoke. And let's pick. Let's give the other one a chance. Is, uh, didn't you intervene earlier on? Francis. Oh. Let's have another hand, and then Francis will come after that one, please. Francis. Okay. Uh, can I continue? Yes, please go ahead. Is that Kenosi? Oh, yes. Please go uh, ahead. What are, okay. What are, okay. Uh, my name is, is Kenoshi Maropola uh, from South Africa, uh, Limpopo province. But now uh, I'm in uh, Gauteng. Uh, I'm okay. studying at a, a, a University of Johannesburg. Welcome. I'm doing, um, yes, I'm doing politics and communication and communications. Excellent. So, what I'm rising on is is that is 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 that uh, like Facebook, like like Facebook app, is not uh, like working uh, like for us. Uh, uh, to, to 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 like to back up my my, my point is that it's in uh, their culture, like their culture, like uh, in their culture. So, like as Africans, uh, like I feel like we need. A, maybe a, 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 a technological uh, like uh, factor that will be in that will be in our culture. 
because uh, it's not helping us. Like, uh, for, for, for example, like we understand, uh, like we, we understand in different way and like we have, uh, like when it, it comes to like education, like we, we differ. So like as Facebook was, is from, is, is from West, it was, it was like, uh, like, like what I can say, like it was, it was done looking uh, like looking Americans, like looking like Western people, like how they is, is their education, how they are educated their, and their understanding. So as when you look in, in, in Africa, like people use it, like most, most people use it for, for, for messaging, like posting, and, and Facebook, what, what I understand about it, it was made for business. But us here, like, we use it like for, 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 for messaging, for posting, like maybe nonsense things. So as, as, as I was saying that uh, like, as Africans, we need a uh, monetization and like we need a uh, parking, we need management, uh, like, we need to, to do something, we need to, to, to create something that will be able like to, to, to manage people and to, to, to monitor people so that maybe we can know uh, like the culture of our people so we can like, we, we can be able like to manage them, uh, like, to, to, <clears throat> like to, to monitor them okay. with such technology, yeah. Thank, thanks, Kenosi. I think you're raising an, an important point. Uh, uh, Francis, uh, earlier on, uh, proposed. Hello. That, uh, hello. He, he proposed that uh, we 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 move towards uh, uh, decentralization of the electoral process, uh, uh, devolution of the electoral process. Now you are also proposing that we need to look carefully and critically into the role of Facebook. And I think you're making an important point. And and others have already questioned the how, how this technology actually is influencing election outcomes. Uh, uh, Francis. Yes, I am. I'm, I'm impressed with the point that was made about how technology is trying to displace the voter in electoral yes. decision. And I yes. will align with you to the, another point which I've raised earlier. I mean, in the chat, that we are also having this tendency of having the judiciary replace the electoral body in some election because. The judgment that gives the candidates uh, uh, clearance as winner is mostly judged on technicalities, which means the voters' interests are not represented adequately. When the matters are pushed to the judiciary and the judgment is judged based on technicality that does not reflect the people who give the mandate. Yes. So just as we must be cautious of the influence of technology in displacing the voter, Absolutely. we must also be cautious of the judiciary almost usurping the power of the sovereignty of the people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, the electoral, electoral adjudication that's on correct. Technical, uh, technical ground and sometimes, if not most times, subverting the will of the people. Absolutely, you're, you're right, uh, Francis. And I think uh, the, the two presentations, and I, almost all the presentations touched on the role of the judiciary. Uh, and, and, and in particular in Kenya and uh, Nigeria, we have to be mindful of uh, uh, the, the problem here, that much as we, we always recommend that all electoral disputes be resolved through you know, legal channels, we also have to be mindful of a danger of what is called now in the literature, the, the current literature, what we call judicialization of politics and politicization of the judiciary. Now, so, 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 so you find a situation where the judiciary you know, takes over, as you say, Francis, from the EMB, and then uh, decisions are also influenced from elsewhere outside the, the courts. In, in, this is the case in, 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 to a large extent in Nigeria and, 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 and Kenya to some extent. And, and, and in, in, in Tunisia, it didn't actually happen in that way. The, the, the president literally, literally, uh, 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 you know, what's the word, uh, uh, asphyxiated the judiciary. 
because he fired you know, a, a, a large chunk of the, 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 the court judges. So I think that's an important point that we shouldn't uh, lose sight of. Uh, we, we, we're running out of time. Uh, can we get uh, more hands, uh, Pumi? Uh, yes, Prof, we have one hand uh, from Omo Sefe. That should be the last hand, yes. Yes, who, who is it? Omo Sefe, you Omo can Omo Sefe, please. Can you hear me now? Yes, we, we can. can. You, yeah. Great, good afternoon. My name is Omo Sefe, we are coming from um, the Nigerian Institute of Social and economic research in Ibadan, Nigeria. So um, I would just like to add my voice um, from the angle of institutional design. And I would like to say that um, beyond what design and structure that uh, African governments and uh, of course Nigeria initiates, that what is more uh, important in my in my uh, thinking is the rule of law. Now, using the Nigerian election, the recent election, um, both the presidential and um, um, gubernatorial elections, we could tell that there was already an established uh, the Electoral Act of 2022 that was passed uh, that had to uh, that actually addressed the transmission of the election results the collation and transmission of results. And it was evident that the entire process, there were issues with the process and not necessarily the outcome. So the process was challenged. And to this end, most of the, the, the uh, laws that were stipulated were not followed regarding hate speech and the like. So I'm, I'm saying, if you look at the, Niger the Nigerian and um, most African uh, situation, even the Kenya uh, situation, uh, in fact, coincidentally, I watched the video of the handshake today, and uh, I was moved emotionally. Yes, but beyond beyond the emotional, beyond that, we need uh, we need uh, a, a more uh, structured. I, I don't know how to put it. The rule of law where people do not just uh, abuse power arbitrarily, because the laws were clearly um, defined as to how the elections. Were, were to be collated and even uh, transmitted using the um, technology now, but along the line, this was not followed. And this, of course, raised a lot of uh, issues. So I'm just saying that even taking the, the issues to the court or having any form of institutional design, we might be back to the same issues if uh, we, we do not actually find out how the rule of law can uh, actually be upheld uh, in the, within the African and, of course, uh, the Nigerian uh, political dynamics. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, uh Institutionalized constitutionalism and rule of law. Now, I'm handing over to my panelists to wind it up. Uh, I just give you you know, uh, 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 brief responses to the questions that uh, are directed to you, and then uh, uh, your closing, you know, uh, 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 takeaways. Closing takeaways. Briefly, briefly, uh, we have 15 minutes to go. So each one of you take three minutes, three minutes, three minutes, so that uh, that we can wrap it up. Three minutes each, please. Let's start. Let's start. Let's go by reverse order. Uh, let's start with Prof. That oh, yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much. I, I would want to pick it up from where my sister from Nigeria has brought it up. And this aligns with the question of how do we envision this institutional design? Well, I would want to say that we are experimenting it in Kenya. In Kenya today, our constitution, the first chapter talks about the sovereignty of the people and the sovereignty of the people supersedes uh, the constitution. So in other words, even the Supreme Court of Kenya is is, uh, is inferior to the people of Kenya, and it can be revisited. And now that is why the opposition now has run around with what we call people's assemblies to find out the views and bring back the power to the people so that they can reorganize those institutions. So that is a good way to go. But generally, the, the institutions should be those that capture the histories and aspirations of the people of Kenya as Africans, 
and, and come up with a, not a copy and paste a methodology of in instituting democracy, but designing democracy like a designer of a cloth will design a cloth that fits so that we don't blame the wearer of the clothes, but the designer himself. So we don't want to use Western neoliberal concepts of democracy if they are not working for Africa. And on the, ro on the role of technology, I would propose that we encourage innovation so that we can have our own home, homegrown uh, technological solutions to our electoral needs so that we don't have to import technology and have people with integrity behind technology because technology is, is manipulated by people. People are behind technology. So if people fail, the technology will fail. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well done, my brother. You spoke for just two and a half minutes. If, I, if the, my other panelists could do the same, please, it will help, we'll save more time. Let's get to uh, Amami, please, Amami. Yes, uh, thank you. So I wanted to go work on, on a few points. Um, uh, I think that institutional design does matter, uh, but it's insufficient in the sense that when we usually talk about institutional design, we talk about formal institutions, legal regulations, uh, organizations that are described in the constitution and composed of individuals who act according to certain uh, uh, clearly written rules but, you, but what we know from the literature, from the most recent literature, that this is insufficient uh, for democracy to survive in hard places where especially there are critical shocks like COVID, for example. And here, um, what scholars have been suggesting recently is the importance of norms that should be internalized in the sense that when, when we talk about respect of mandates or respect of, um, of democratic processes, um, People need to understand that, need to internalize that and accept that because sometimes institutions fail to guarantee the persistence of democratically elected government. And that's something that we saw in Tunisia when the, when the uh, constitution, the only constitutional article on the state of emergency was, was written in a blurry way. So the military did not really understand um, what is the argument they present, not understand what was acceptable or what was not. Was it better to um, simply comply to what the commander in chief does, uh, even if it's anti democratic, or um, consider the parliament as well uh, as a source of uh, civilian control and preserve it and prevent, present, present, uh, prevent, um, prevent the president take over all powers. And what we know from the literature of civil military relations in this situation that does matter in the, in the African continent because um, 2021 was the, um, so we had five coups plus one self coup in total six, which is the highest number of coups in one year since um, the uh, early 1990s. So these kind of institutions that are critical to the survival um, of, um, of democracy don't have to do with what we often attribute to the will of the people and cannot be preserved by simple uh, institutional design. But uh, we, so it, to make it short, we need to work more on um, the cultural part and making our democratic institutions of people who are governing and have some sense of amount of power truly believe in democracy instead of um, taking uh, sometimes um, risk that can be driven by just moment, uh, temporary and short, um, short run uh, change of preferences like COVID again this is a great example. Um, and what we also need to understand is that we should, uh, countries that manage to succeed in Thank development and, and in establishing democracies are countries that manage to learn from other countries' successful experiences uh, and not countries that were willing to engage in um, extremely you. risky experiences like President Kai Saeed is doing now, which is thank leading you. us to autocracy. And thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Cynthia, please. 
Yes, um, thank you. I'll start with the question on technology. I do believe that technology does not automatically guarantee integrity. In fact, technology is supposed to enable the process of transparency. And for me, when it comes to technology, three things are important. First, issue around ownership. And I'm glad Prof made the mention around that. Ownership, um, can the people take ownership of the process? Are the people part of the consultation to design a technology that they all adapt and agree to? The other part for me is around the principles of transparency and integrity in the, in the adaptation of the technology for the, for the process. And the, fourth, the third and the most important is if technology is introduced to address a problem and not create more problems. And I think that is where a lot of um, questions around electoral technology has come up from our own electoral electoral process, because a lot of people were inspired with the technology, and I'll connect this to the question on collation. Um, technology was supposed to promote transparency in the results collation process in Nigeria, but for the presidential elections, that particular innovation was set aside. And so a lot of people felt that such an innovation that was homegrown, and a lot of people celebrated ahead of the elections, was now something that was sidestepped side, um, side on elections day. And so those, that would be my thoughts on technology. The conversation around um, judicial, the judicialization of politics as Prof, as prof, as, um, prof put it. Now in Nigeria, beginning to see an increasing role of the court in our elections. And sadly, there is no guarantee on how courts determine issues. As some of the, and uh, Francis mentioned, most times decisions are made based on technicalities. We have a governor in a particular state whom the voters in the state call the Supreme Court governor. Because even at observers and experts in the elections, none of us could understand the interpretation of the court that led to the emergence of that governor as a governor because the court became a coalition officer and the question is what happens to the power of the people if you vote and then the court now overturns the decision based on technicalities and for me ahead as we move forward in building our demo in our, our electoral democracy important things for the court is question around neutrality independent and upholding the principles and values of democracy. Because if the court no longer is the hope of the ordinary citizen, then where lies the hope of the average citizen? And I think that is where the major challenge is. And the third and last point for me is around the redesign of institution. And I believe that as Africans, I'm a strong Pan-Africanist, and I believe that we need to start that broader conversation on redesigning a democracy that is that captures the African values and that it's homegrown. So we don't need to copy and paste whatever we have from the West. Can we begin to have conversation inwardly? What is truly African and how can we build systems that emphasize accountability, but most importantly, project Africa as a leader in the world? Because I do believe that we have the potential as a continent to be a leader and not just to engage with the West from a beggarly point of view, but it all begins with how we engage as a people within the continent. Thank you thank so you much so, for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Thank you so much to all the three of you. A very rich discussion. Uh, frankly, the summary is this in one sentence. The, 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 the Africa's democracy will continue to decline as long as citizens are not put at the center. And we keep injecting technology that we have no control over with interest from outside. And we need to redesign, not only institutions, but even the democracy itself to fit the African context. Uh, oh yeah, I hand over to you. Uh, five minutes, uh, we, we still have uh, for the next session. Thank you to my panelists. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, uh, colleagues. Uh, thank you to Prof. Mark Rosa um, for uh, moderating the first uh, panel. Uh, great insights uh, when we reflect on the various, uh, various elections that have taken place on the African continent. Uh, thank you to our three uh, panelists uh, for your, your insights and everyone that has engaged us on the matter. We are going to swiftly move to the second panel that will be now forecasting. The first panel was reflections on the elections and the political developments on the three countries and broadly the African continent speaking. Now the second panel is now going to look into the elections that are holding um uh, the that are supposed to be holding elections uh, this year and next year um as i know that the the, the poster had said that uh, mr terry was going to chair 
However, um, he had a, his family emergency, there's a bereavement, um, and has unfortunately had to pull out. We are therefore going to ask the panelist in um, the second uh, panel, Mr. Jack Zaba from the National Democratic Institute, to then play the role of both panelist and chair. So Mr. Jack Zaba is going to now um, uh, present and thereafter will then moderate the session going forward. He's a senior program officer from the National Democratic Institute in Zimbabwe, extensive uh, um, experience in elections and political processes. Uh, Mr. Jack um, Zaba, over to you, sir. And thank you to uh, panelists from uh, the, the first session. So uh, I think the, uh, this part, as Vusi has highlighted, who broadly focused into the upcoming elections uh, in Zimbabwe, uh, then upcoming elections in South Africa. So the three panelists, uh, for uh, three speakers for this session, uh, who include uh, myself talking about Zimbabwe and the expected elections in, in Zimbabwe. Like it's highlighted, I've basically have been working on elections in Zimbabwe over the past 17 to 18 years, but with wide ranging experience uh, observing or studying about elections in other countries uh, across Africa. So this is an interesting platform uh, for me as a practitioner, uh, mainly I'm not from the academic uh, 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 landscape. Um, I've been working in civic society, uh, mainly or the non-governmental organizations, but still doing, doing elections. Then the Second uh, panelist uh, will be our good professor, uh, Prof. Uh, Susan Boysen. Uh, she has a rich, a rich history as well. I think in one of my, my journeys professionally, I've met her and read about what she, 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 she studied or did surveys on elections, especially in Zimbabwe. Uh, then the third panelist is Dr. Nomsa Masuku. Again, we will not uh, read uh, through uh, a rich history, uh, but I think it has been uh, projected on the on the screen. We can all interact with that and get to understand uh, her uh, better uh, during the the conversations. So our presentations again will be. 12 minutes each, for each of us uh, that will lead eventually uh, into uh, discussions. We really witnessed rich discussions in the earlier session. So we will start uh, basically on Zimbabwe. Uh, then after that, we will have Prof. Uh, Boysen and uh, Dr. Masuku uh, coming in. So without wasting much time, I will shift to my other uh, role as, as a speaker and talk a bit uh, in 12 minutes about Zimbabwe, uh, basically looking at elections that are upcoming in Zimbabwe and the emerging dynamics and trends around these uh, elections. So my first take is just background. You, you look uh, at the fact that Zimbabwe has been uh, holding elections uh, since 1980 with almost nine parliamentary elections, six presidential elections uh, since 1980. And religiously, uh, the country has been following uh, the provisions of which its constitution in terms of holding regular uh, elections. Then uh, we've had a lot of cycles in terms of the evolution of the election administration, uh, framework, evaluation of the legal framework uh, governing elections in Zimbabwe. And uh, you will find that the, the, the tipping point or the, the, the historic point was the adoption of a constitution, a new constitution in 2013, that is May 2013, which has governed uh, or, or elections uh, since 2013 with another cycle of elections in 2018, 
And again, now we are facing uh, a set of another uh, uh, a round of, of general elections. So you find the, the new constitution then provided for a, a sort of tripartite elections, uh, which provide for a, a holding of elections at local authority, at a, a national assembly level, and presidential on the same day or days if uh, conditions change. So those elections were held in 2018 and uh, the elections happened uh, on the background of uh, a transition that didn't involve elections. And this uh, transition is usually called a military trans, a military assisted transition and others would prefer to call it a, a coup. Uh, but it's a question of terminology. But what was witnessed in 2017 was a change of government that uh, did not come out of elections. Eight months later, we then had elections in, uh, in, uh, in July 2018. Uh, and one thing to pick from there as we shift focus into, into 2023 20, uh, is there was massive voter turnout, uh, about 85%. Uh, uh, people turned up to vote. But of course, the period following that had a lot of issues. And even the elections themselves had a lot of uh, 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 issues which needs to be improved uh, as highlighted by over 12 observer missions which were deployed for the 2018 election. So since 2018 up to now, I think there are a lot of uh, things uh, or positives which can be picked. Uh, and also negatives which uh, emerged and uh, which we may need to track and follow as we get into 2023 uh, elections. One of the things that I think can uh, highlight is the, uh, the ratification of the African Charter on, on Democracy, Elections and Governance. This happened in 2021 20, in November, I think basically at the principles or norms and the standards level. This was something which was commendable. A lot of electoral stakeholders highlighted the importance of doing that. Uh, politically, it's an indication that we have uh, a, a government willing to reform in a particular fashion consistent with what the region uh, may be desires. So that, that happened in 2021. Uh, then following that, there were uh, some attempts to amend the, the laws consistent to recommendations from observer missions. Uh, part of those reforms which are currently uh, incomplete at that stage uh, is the maybe expansion and extension of the women's quota provisions and expanding it to local government. Initially it was uh, at the national assembly level. Uh, but the biggest uh, thing that emerged was maybe an attempt to amend the public elder laws and the media freedom laws, uh, which were some of the major recommendations from the observer mission. But uh, uh, if you look at analysis from a lot of stakeholders, it tells you that that kind of, uh, of reform was either inadequate or still uh, incomplete to be able to satisfy and necessary conditions for elections in 2023. So I will just highlight uh, about four critical aspects that need to be uh, followed uh, in terms of emerging trends. And I really enjoyed uh, listening to trends or whatever happening in other countries, Kenya, Nigeria. And uh, I, I, I smiled looking at some of those issues really uh, have lots in common uh, with what uh, is obtaining in, in Zimbabwe. So the first thing I want to highlight uh, will be around the aspect of reforms uh, and the lethargy that is associated with the, the, uh, the, the attempt to reform the electoral processes. I'll speak also about the shrinking democratic space uh, and some sort of criminalization of civic society work. Then I'll also go to the aspect of election management itself. Uh, in terms of how uh, its current state may be an impediment to uh, electoral integrity as we get to uh, 2023 uh, elections. Then 
I'll also speak a bit about the role of the judiciary and the election dispute resolution mechanism. So I'll just highlight those four and maybe uh, uh, look at how money in, is playing a role in politics uh, and in shaping or manipulating uh, the citizen choice. So in terms of reforms, uh, we, we are looking at a situation where uh, despite being a, a catalog of uh, recommendations from observer missions in 2020, 2018, there's been lack of political will. That political will uh, has been missing uh, in terms of pushing, advancing the, that such kind of reforms that were, were needed in terms of improving the electoral architecture. Uh, so that uh, unwillingness is actually uh, captured in some phrases which uh, emanate from senior government officials or party officials who, who go on and tell you that we can't reform ourselves out of power. And it's reflective in the uh, lack of action at a legislative level in terms of pushing a reform agenda. So we are left with conditions which obtained largely in 2018, if not getting worse uh, in terms of the political environment. And linked to that, you then find that uh, the, the country is in, in, enmeshed in a sustained uh, effort to really close the democratic space. You'll find that if you compare it, the period from November 2017 to July 2018, uh, Zimbabwe witnessed what many would prefer to call a honeymoon uh, in terms of uh, Every enjoyment of fundamental freedoms, allowing people to campaign, allowing civil society to do their work of promoting awareness or sharing information. So that has been missing. And uh, again, we've seen uh, use of law. Uh, there's a current uh, uh, bill in, in, uh, before the president, which if signed would criminalize a lot of civil society work uh, uh, that is really essential, which is essential in terms of uh, promoting participation in the elections. Then the other aspect which we need to follow is the weakened and fractured uh, election management body. The Electoral Commission uh, is really in recent uh, months has shown that the, there is a huge element of discohesion uh, which uh, resulted in some uh, commissioners taking part or, or signing affidavits uh, where they, they dissociated themselves from a, a recent electoral boundary delimitation exercise, which had so many issues in terms of transparency levels, in terms of compliance with the constitution. So you have seven out of nine commissioners doing typically what also happened in Kenya uh, in, in, in the past election where they broke ranks with their other uh, commissioners uh, in, in terms of discrediting whatever process they had managed. So that, that again is something Zimbabwe is staring at and going into an election, you have a, a, a fractured a, a election management body, which a, a really dents any hopes or any trust in terms of them being a, able to handle elections in the next uh, four or five months. Then the other aspect I need to, uh, to highlight before my 12 minutes get, come to an end is the aspect of, uh, ineffective electoral justice system where there's huge mistrust in the judiciary uh, and they, uh, some have gone to the extent of uh, providing evidence that would show uh, elements of judiciary capture. And uh, on the other hand, you also have the same judiciary being burdened with the election dispute resolution mechanisms. So most of the aspects of EDR or election dispute resolution are channeled to the judiciary, but this is the same judiciary uh, which most citizens have lack of trust on. So the, again, this uh, provides a black spot as we get to the to the next uh, election. Uh, I will highlight the last two aspects. Uh, the one of it, there has been a sustained. Uh, degradation and criminalization of opposition politics in general. So in recent months, we have seen uh, in a, a, most of the opposition uh, parties' uh, activities, including rallies, in, including appearance on national TV, has been uh, really banned. So you, you find an opposition failing to hold a rally. But you also find opposition leaders being incarcerated, uh, something akin to the 
colonial era where you have opposition leaders detained without uh, without a trial. We have one of the prominent leaders who is who is reaching almost a year in prison without trial. Then lastly, I, I think one trend and one thing Zimbabwe may uh, teach uh, the region is the aspect, the embeddedness of the military in electoral politics. Uh, historically, you have a country which emerged from a gruesome uh, liberation war struggle, but the same uh, uh, fighters transitioned easily, seamlessly into government, and they've been holding fort and sustaining the hegemony. So at any given point, you still have electoral politics really impeded by the overbearing presence of the military in civic spaces, in government spaces. So you have them embedded and with vested interests. Some of them will even appear as candidates at some point. Some will seamlessly transition from the barracks to the to government offices. So that has created a, a lot of mistrust in electoral governance in general, because most citizens now feel, even if you participate in an election, that uh, essentially will not lead uh, into any uh, uh, alter, alternation of power or transfer of power. So it may uh, lead to massive disillusionment and uh, apathy in the 2023 election. So I think being chair as well, I will allow myself to end here. And if there are any uh, further discussions to my few highlights, we will uh we will proceed uh through the the plenary discussion um so i will, will quickly then ask uh, uh Pro professor Boyson to to come in and make a presentation i i suspect we are comfortable with having the three panelists speak then we have our questions thank you thank you mr zaba and fellow panelists across this event. Such a privilege to join in this forum with people from across the continent. And yes, Mr. Zaba, it was fascinating to listen to Zimbabwe. So many striking similarities in the processes, even if it is different phases of post-liberation politics, even if multi-party politics in many anti and elections in quite a few respects take different routes comparing South Africa and Zimbabwe, there are a few striking similarities. And I think they will emerge as I give you, it's going to be a very brief overview of the political landscape at this stage in South Africa, especially the pre-2024 electoral landscape. When we know elections are probably to be expected around late April, early May 2024, that is national and provincial elections in South Africa. And those will be the sixth set of national and provincial elections taking place post-1994 liberation moment <clears throat> in South Africa. Well, as everybody around this meeting probably knows, South Africa is never short of dramatic moments and dramatic transitions, benchmark transitions in our politics, even if it is within the broad parameters of electoral contestation and a particular form of multi-party, multi-partyism that has come to characterize South African electoral politics. And that is really one party dominance within a quite a vibrant multi-party democracy, democracy system, but a vib vibrancy that is has been so far and possibly kind of will continue to be into 2024, not a type of vibrancy that directly challenges the ANC in its continuous dominance. As I'll allude to in a few minutes, even if the ANC is at this dramatic moment at this at the point of the forthcoming election of possibly losing an outright majority at the national level and at several provincial levels across South Africa's nine provinces, it still retains overall quite an edge, an edge of, it's say 20 to 25% 
over the biggest opposition party. More of that in, in the next few minutes. I will briefly in this quick presentation talk about electoral trends and expectations regarding turnout, the expectations of the results that we can see in next year's elections, and then just take stock of so many of the sentiments that we have also heard about in relation to the other countries in both these panels. Trust, distrust, cynicism, loss of hope, elections without choice. Many of these phenomena are very profound at this moment, perhaps more than ever since 1994 in South Africa. So that will be a quick few points in, in my input here. First, of course, I, I mentioned 2024 as a likely benchmark turning point in South Africa's electoral history of one party dominance within multipartyism. And yes, we can just reflect back as a few of these previous moments. 1994, of course, was such an important moment for the ANC in its negotiated transition and elections that were part of that transition. And the ANC would have gained exceptional powers had it gained that 66 or two thirds majority in, in those elections, which would have entitled it. It got to that point later on, but didn't use it. But a two thirds majority would have entitled you to make quite far reaching changes to the just negotiated, then just negotiated constitution of South Africa. It ended up in 65 point decimals, a percentage of the vote. And in many people still speculate to this day as to whether that was a real or a manufactured outcome, because the fact that the ANC did not get the two thirds majority in that election meant that there was quite an appeasement of right-wing and reactionary and conservative and former Bantistan politics, politicians and political interests in the country. It was reassuring to many of those parties that the ANC had not gained that majority. So 1994 in own right was a pivotal moment there. And then of course the ANC, their hopes were high, optimism was fabulous in South Africa. And the ANC economy also continued going quite well. And the ANC went up to a percentage just short of two thirds in the following election with the help of the then, it still exists, but even smaller than then, minority front, that small, largely ethnically based party from KwaZulu Natal. The ANC did get a two thirds majority but didn't really use that majority to do to effect dramatic legislation or constitutional changes. And then the ANC in own right, of course, grew to in 2004 to that 69.69% of the vote, which was the peak at which the ANC started turning around. It was a large two thirds majority, but by then at that time other issues started holding the ANC back and it did not have the political will to forge dramatic far reaching changes. Also because probably it had become more pro-business, business aligned and it largely operated by some precepts of expectations of the, of the international political economic institutions and its balance of payments, et cetera. And then of course, after subsequently, the, the game started changing as the ANC precipitously started declining in its support. And to the point of in 2016, for example, losing major metropolitan governments across the country. And that trend consolidated dramatically in 2021. Those local government elections of almost two years ago by now. And there was that small point in between in 2019 in national elections, when Cyril Ramaphosa as president just took over from former president Jacob Zuma and there were huge expectations that things are really going to change. Government is really going to be more responsive, more able to take care of the needs of South Africans. 
But that did not quite happen. That moment, what they called in South Africa, Ramaphoria, that euphoria of Ramaphosa's ascent into power, has by now quite completely dissipated. And these illustrations, just briefly to show, yes, there have been other definitive moments in South African electoral politics, very crucial moments, but often they went, they slipped by quietly and in the end did not mean that much. But then now we get in South Africa to this point of ANC possibly losing at national level and at some provinces, including those crucial provinces of KwaZulu-Natal and Gauteng, losing outright majorities in those governments. And what that does to politics in South Africa. We have to consider here that the ANC is not guaranteed by all current opinion polls, and there are quite a few available. I mentioned them briefly. It is no guarantee at this stage that the ANC will slip below 50%, although the chances are pretty good. If we take the electoral trends of decline since the time of 2009, those, local, those national elections with ANC started dipping downward, ANC at national level has been climbing on average in region of three to four, sometimes marginally over four percentage points declines per election. One cannot accept that those, the size of those declines will remain the same, but coincidentally that has been the case in about three elections at national level down three to four percentage points per election. At local government elections, they where we see many more are these coalitions emerging because ANC has slipped below 50%. Yeah, reminder, right? Prof, we have, we have four minutes left. I thank you, I'll rush it. The yeah. ANC has been planning at local level at around eight percentage points per election. So the decline locally has been far faster and steeper than at national level. And the ANC at the last election having had around approximately 57% nationally of the vote, if that proportion of decline persists, the ANC could very well still end up to above 50% of the vote, even if marginally so. However, despite that, general trend, the public opinion polls, and they have been once by the Social, so Social Research Foundation, by the Brentos Foundation, by the Ravonia Circle, several by, several by the media company, research company Ipsos, that all indicate a performance in a range of between 42% and 52% in the next election. And it is, of course, difficult at this stage, more than a year before the elections, to say exactly accurately who will vote, who will abstain, and how they will vote. Because a big trend in the way in which ANC has been keeping power across recent elections has been the performance of opposition parties. Opposition parties have largely aided the ANC in its retention of political power. There have been several projects of splits from the ANC and ANC manufactured micro parties over the years. We think of splits of Congress of the People, Economic Freedom Fighters. There have been other small parties like National Freedom Party in KwaZulu Natal, the Independent Democrats, small parties that have helped the ANC retain power in crucial places. And this is a very big part of the ANC's current power game where coalition government is one of the ways in which it retains power. Besides protests being very accommodating, accommodative of protests and protests, South Africa is really a protest nation. We love protests happening alongside the ANC and acting as a shock absorber in many respects, helping the ANC come election time to again retain support. So at protests is there, now coalition politics is also there. And if we, we look at the scenarios as to INC performance come 2024, we would be one lower 40s where the ANC really would need a bigger party 
like the economic freedom fighters to help get it to retain government power. Uh, even if shared in the coalition, perhaps with the EFF, many still think and voters also like the idea of to, to the ex equivalent extent roughly as the idea of a coalition with the EFF. Voters are really split between those coalition for the ANC with the ANC with the DA or with the EFF. And that is as, so those two possibilities are there if the ANC is in the lower 40s. If the ANC goes next year's elections above 45%, it could make do with a few what I call top up parties, smaller parties that would be easier to manage as a coalition partner than economic freedom fighters for the ANC, easier to manage. And then one would obviously look at the model that we see unfolding in a pretty chaotic, I'll finish in a second, thank you, in a pretty chaotic local government coalitions where there is huge instability, very little focus on governance issues where those really get neglected. So those are the scenarios looking forward. If we look forward to the ANC and its performance come next elections. And it's very important to note that turnout in South Africa is still relatively high. And so there is shock absorption space there, but youth, young voters are disproportionately disinterested nowadays in participating in elections. And that can create a higher level of instability and uncertainty in South Africa. So yes, and the mood in South Africa is one of despondency, of disillusionment, and not having much hope that elections will really change anything. But South Africans still love their elections. And come an election campaign in 2014, they will probably be available for mobilization again, although the, I, I expect the percentage participation again to go down in the next election. And overall, in the longer term, my first very strong implications for the legitimacy of the system and sustainability of multi-party democracy. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you so much, Prof, uh, for the enlightening uh, uh, views. Uh, yeah, in consideration of time, let's quickly move over to Dr. Uh, Nomsa. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, and good afternoon uh, to uh, everyone that is on the platform. May I thank uh, my fellow panelists uh, for making my job and my life much, much easier because you've laid the ground for what it is that I've been asked to do. My brief for this afternoon is twofold. I've been asked to uh, look at uh, the changing patterns in voter uh, behavior, and I thank uh, um, Professor Boysons for touching on that in her concluding um, part of her input, and to also talk about uh, the preparedness of the electoral management body in South Africa. May I please uh, begin with a disclaimer? I do speak uh, from the perspective of an election management body. And so that is the perspective that I, I'm going to bring to this conversation. I think maybe before I begin, because we do have um, a continental wide audience, uh, may I, um, say what it is that in law, the Electoral Commission of South Africa is charged to do by the Constitution of South Africa. It's charged to do three things. The first one is that it is charged with managing elections of national, provincial, and municipal legislative bodies. It is also charged with ensuring that those elections are free and fair. And it is also charged with uh, declaring um, the results of elections. The last point is not something that is often uh, the same, in, uh, it's not a responsibility that is covered by all the mentioned uh, electoral management bodies uh, on the continent, as you will have heard um, in the earlier presentations. Sometimes the declaration of results is left to other bodies other than the election management body itself. I think, I thought, uh, let me begin with the, with, with the general trend of, um, of uh, voter behavior. The electoral commission, um, uh, has research that it has been doing over a period of 20 years. It uh, triangulates that research uh, with other studies, uh, notably Afrobarometer, which um, also 
uh, came out uh, around the time when we were looking at the longitudinal analysis of uh, work that we've been doing over a period of 10 years. I want to highlight uh, uh, the following things that come from um, the study, but not dissimilar to what all my other colleagues have said across uh, the, 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 from the beginning of this uh, of this session. The first one is that um, we the, the research shows um, a loss of um, what we call internal political efficacy. That is the declining belief that. Um, the vote um, is going to make any difference. So in South Africa, for example, uh, we see that um, it has dropped right down to 35 percent uh, where in 2021, where it rose uh, from a low of 31 percent in 2020. That is, uh, of course, um, uh, results in a sharp drop in uh, voter turnout, which my uh, colleague, uh, Professor Boyson, has spoken about. The sharpest drop was, of course, in 2021. Um, and the features of that uh, decline, as Professor Boyson has said, is mainly um, the alienation of, uh, of, young, of young people and the growing gap of registration on the voters' roll between uh, females and males. There's a 10% gap on re in registration uh, on the voters' roll between male and females. The second feature that we see from the research is that there is what is called the external political efficacy. Um, so generally in South Africa, there is a, a belief, a declining confidence or trust in the responsiveness of the political system. So that can uh, have a problem with the political system itself. And they are opting out of the system because they believe in what we call um, a certain show of uh, fatalism. They're saying it doesn't really matter who you choose. Once those people have been chosen, they tend to behave in exactly the same way. The fourth uh, factor that I want to point to is that characteristic with a, a democratic uh, recession in, so, in, in South Africa, we find that trust in uh, the, the institutions that support uh, democracy across the board is checking downwards. That pool downwards is also affecting trust in the election management body itself. Even though the Electoral Commission of South Africa compared to other institutions that support uh, democracy, uh, is still relatively high, it is declining, and it is declining at an alarming rate. The, the, the fifth one that I want to point out, which does not come out as strongly in the research that I'm alluding to, it is the corrosive impact of disinformation, uh, particularly on social media. And what you find is that that uh, uh, disinformation is perpetuated not just by the people that don't vote, but it is also perpetuated by um, the, the, the contestants themselves. Uh, in South Africa also, I think what I want to mention before I exit this point, it is that um, the people that actually do turn out to vote. In South Africa, we have a voters roll that has 26 million voters. The potential that uh, eligible voters in South Africa are 52 million. So we have a growing gap of 16 million people that are eligible to vote, but choose not to vote. In South Africa, you can't vote unless you have registered. That is a source of worry because that first step of being on the voters roll is not being used, uh, despite the efforts of the election management body to make uh, registration easier, to make it, um, <clears throat> you no longer have to do it in person. Uh, we still don't see the dividends of that, uh, of that improvement. People still stubbornly stay away from the voters roll. With that, I'd like to talk very briefly about the preparedness of the Electoral Management uh, Commission of South Africa to host the forthcoming elections. As uh, Professor Boyson just said, the term of the current uh, administration is going to end uh, sometime in 2024. And the, the window for running elections is between uh, May of 2024 and August of 2024. It's a 90-day window. What we know is that the Apex Court in South Africa has, has said very clearly it does not have the appetite 
to have elections run outside the constitutional window. So we cannot say that uh, in the event that there are any unforeseen uh, delays, that we will approach the court again and ask for uh, leniency on that time frame. We have to deliver that election within that 90 day uh, framework. Why is that particularly important? It is important because in 2021, the Constitutional Court found that the Electoral Act is not constitutional because it prescribes that in order for you to stand as a candidate, um, you have to, be, to do so via a political party. The Constitutional Court, I am summarizing, said that if the, 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 the right to uh, stand for elections and if you win to, um, to, be, um, to represent should not be reliant upon you being a member of a political party. And so the, the, the Electoral um, Act was found not to be constitutional. So the, the, the Constitutional Court asked the National Assembly to amend um, the, the, the Electoral Act. The National Assembly uh, took a while to begin the process. And uh, eventually, uh, when it did, it has come up with a, an electoral amendment bill, which has recently been uh, adopted by the National Assembly, which seeks to insert uh, independent candidates into contestation. In other words, independents can now contest for elections, both at uh, the provi provincial and national um, legislators without going through uh, a political party. There are dissenting opinions uh, that, that, that are there. The law, is, the, 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 the law is currently before the president. The president has said that um, that bill uh, in front of him for just over a month, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, he has not yet assented to the law. The implications of that is that it is beginning to eat into the time that the Electoral Commission I need in order to prepare for elections. Uh, we don't have a law that you can use in order to prepare for those elections. And the longer that the period uh, takes, the, the less time that the Electoral Commission has. It threatens the, the timeline that we need in order to, to prepare for, for delivering a free and fair election. There are challenges that we expect. We believe that even if the, the president assents to the bill, and turns it into law, we, we are almost certain that it will be challenged um, in the Constitutional Court uh, because we, um, there is a section of the population that uh, read the directives of the Constitutional Court to mean an overhaul of the electoral system and is therefore unhappy that, that this particular bill has not done that. However, that having been noted, the Electoral Commission continues its preparations insofar as uh, the law that the, the bill that we have in place. In South Africa, most of our processes, save for balloting and completion of the results sleep at a voting station, are online. So that includes delimitation of, of voting districts, the voter registration, candidate nomination, et cetera, et cetera. The list is very long. And if I list all of that, I might not have time to conclude. So what we are trying to do is to, to do as much work as we can in the following areas that are impacted by the change in the, in the Electoral Amendment Act. It is, we need to develop a new system for um, quota requirements. So the quotas that uh, independents are going to need and parties that have not contested before um, is going to be an issue and we need to design um, a program that will uh, do that uh, for us. We'll have to rewrite the, 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 resu the results system. We need to rewrite the candidate nomination system as well. We need to um, add an extra ballot or, um, at the moment in the past uh, national elections. We've had two um, ballot papers in the forthcoming elections. If the bill goes through, it's going to be three. We have to increase um, the time that is necessary in the election timetable by approximately 29 days to allow for the production of uh, the ballot paper and uh, also candidate nomination. Uh, then, the, then we also have to plan for um, full swing 
uh, based on the act that is before um, the, 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 pre the president. So in other, in other words, plan for the minute details. And then we have to roll out uh, logistics, uh, which has become routinized in the Electoral Commission of South Africa as we have run elections quite often. So if you ask me um, how ready are we, we are as ready as uh, can be expected, given uh, the uncertainty that we are facing because of the absence of a, of, 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 of a law that we are going to organize uh, elections using. Uh, Chair, I'm going to stop there and I'm gonna take uh, 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 comments and questions in the interaction. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Masuku, uh, for, for your presentation. So we notice we have about 15 minutes. Uh, so we have a, a very, very, very tight uh, plenary session. So I will allow for quick questions in five minutes, then the last 10 minutes will be for closing uh, 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 comments or uh, feedback from the panelists. Uh, I noticed there are some questions on the uh, on the chat box, and uh, I think our panelists will look at those and respond to them as well. So, any quick questions in the next five, five minutes? Uh, if one can vocalize. Uh, Mr. Zaba, we currently have no hands raised at the moment, but we have quite a few questions in the oh. chat box. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. So I, and I think... just as a reminder, our webinar um, will finish at 6 p.m. So you okay. do have a bit of time to engage with questions before we do the vote of thanks. Oh, perfect. So okay. we are fine. So I think as we wait for or any other additional questions. So I can see we have some questions on the chat. Q&A. Yeah. Uh, let me look at some of those. I think there's one which says, how do we in Africa explain the emerging trend of African politicians taking their campaigns to Europe and making America, uh, uh, to Europe and America and seeking external validation? of the aspirations. Then there's another one uh, which concerns, is it possible to unkindly unpick what can be done to motivate citizen trust in electoral processes after the onerous challenges uh, you mentioned, such as militarization of the whole process, uh, lack of political will to instigate reforms and criminalization of civil society work. Uh, is there another third question? Yes, uh, there's one by Dr. Kaziboni, Dr. Anthony. Uh, this, this question is directed to you, Mr. Zaba. He says, within the ambience of democracy, how do you view the 2017 transition? The late former president, Robert Mugabe, described his unseating as a quote-unquote coup. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Uh, yeah, I can see a couple of them directed at me. Uh, the, the other one is, is there enough incentive for Zimbabweans to go out and vote in numbers this year? What is the level of trust in the electoral system among its citizens lead, leading up to this year's elections? Okay. So uh, do we have any other hands? Someone who may need to add one or two questions before we 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 have a round of responses from the panelists. We have one question for Dr. Masuka from Shingirai, who asks, what does your research at the IEC show regarding the disparities between voter registration according to gender? What interventions would you recommend to increase registration among women? Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, I think I can quickly uh, respond to questions directed to me, then I, I defer to Dr. Masuku uh, and uh, Prof. Boysen. So in terms of uh, Zimbabwe, they, there was one interesting question from uh, Anthony Kazbon, is it? Yeah. Uh, 
in terms of what happened in 2017, yeah, it has been a contestation of narratives, really, uh, where on one hand you have uh, those who follow the book of democracy uh, are really measuring uh, the transition in terms of the principles and norms of a democratic transition. So if you follow that really in all aspects and uh, in, in, in whatever color, that uh, really does not uh, uh, align with the principles of democracy. But then you have a narrative that uh, is uh, being advanced uh, by those who actively instigated the transition, uh, where they say it was above the law, and you then have a situation uh, where that person was even presented to a high court, in which case the high court said uh, it was uh, constitutional. So if it's to, to my opinion, I think basically it falls outside uh, the, the prisms of any democratic transition. Uh, but again, as I highlighted, it is uh, always uh, subjected to a contestation of narratives uh, in terms of whether it was a coup, whether it was a military assisted transition, uh, you you do have a, a government which is uh, very robust in terms of countering any narratives in that regard. Uh, then there was the question of uh, uh, how do we motivate citizens in the electoral processes under under the the military no reforms and the criminalization of civil society work. I will attach that to a question from Kanyis or Similani uh, in terms of saying, is there enough incentive for Zimbabweans to go out and vote in numbers uh, this year? Uh, uh, what is the real level of trust in the electoral system among the citizens leading up to this year's elections? So you will find that, like I mentioned, in 2018, we had a very uh, big rise in terms of, of voter uh, turnout. 85% is by no means small number. It's really very impressive. But you, if you look at that context uh, and looking at elections before the 2018 elections, you will realize that the context really allowed for voter turnout to, to flourish in 2018. Uh, this is because there were uh, uh, efforts really in a big way to, to open the democratic spaces, people were allowed to demonstrate. So the, uh, the honeymoon, which I highlighted, really allowed for citizens to express themselves and it reignited hope among a citizen and uh, it reinvigorated the belief that possibly elections can be a way of expressing yourself or, or, or a way of changing uh, or uh, retaining a government. So the 85% was good. Five years later, situations are different. In fact, uh, three days after the July 2018 elections, we, we took a tailspin back into the old Zimbabwe uh, in terms of political freedoms, uh, starting with the infamous one August uh, protest, which led into the unfortunate death of about seven people. Uh, being be, being led by the state in terms of attack on those citizens. So from that moment up to this uh, time, that honeymoon is over and is indeed over because five years uh, now, no one is really enjoying the prospect of uh, thinking of any demonstration, even a labor-related demonstration uh, will be heavily dealt with by the state. Uh, no one would think of, of anything, even organizing uh, meetings for civil society organizations has become really difficult uh, where the, 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 the police services are actively uh, bar or use some, uh, some unreasonable grounds to dismiss any part of civic uh, action. So all that and in the midst of uh, no reforms and uh, in the midst of a situation where civic society work is actually been criminalized because usually you'd find that in terms of raising citizen awareness there's been civic society at the forefront of course complementing the efforts of the electoral commission but now we do have civic society which is 
almost in a state of paralysis uh, because of their work. Yes, the bill is still uh, in transit to be signed as a, as a law because it was uh, passed by parliament, but it's awaiting presidential assent. But there is a probably a fear uh, among a civil society leaders in terms of if that bill becomes law, then that will be doomsday. So in all that effort, it leaves citizens without any amount of motivation or enough information to really uh, reinvigorate their trust in the electoral system. So the five years we have seen a backsliding and prospects for, for, for another high turnout are really slim at the moment. We have seen a growing number of young people, especially who are facing serious economic challenges and are not allowed even to express themselves in any other way, uh, are only left with an election, but they don't really believe uh, from recent studies that the, the, the election may change anything after all. And then in relation to the trust on the, on the electoral management body, uh, there was a recent study by Afrobarometer. It, it actually showed a decline in trust and confidence in the electoral management body. It was below 50. Uh, but again, it has gone further down uh, below 50. So a combination of all that will really culminate into very, very low turnout from analysis being done by civil society organizations and other analysts from the academia uh, in terms of prospects for voter turnout. So I think I will end there, then allow Dr. Masuku to come in. There was a question directed to her then Prof. Boysen to respond to any of those issues raised on the platform. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair, and thank you to, uh, to the colleague that posed the question. Um, at, at, at the moment, there is um, the, the, the reasons for the gap between female and male uh, registration are not uh, immediately clear. Uh, we only see the fact, the fact that there is a gap of about 10% between um, registration of females and males, with females being uh, uh, more than males on the, on the voters' roll. And also females tend to turn out more in, uh, in elections. The reason for that, uh, we've, um, in the process of commissioning uh, work, that is not just uh, qualitative, uh, uh, quantitative, but rather qualitative in order to investigate that phenomenon. Uh, in terms of um, motiva motivating women to, to register, um, I think uh, the, the Electoral Commission motivates everyone to, to, to register as well. Uh, we do focus on, on youth, we do focus on, on, on women. But I think the lessons that are coming out of research are telling us something slightly, slightly different. When uh, the, the, the sharp drop in voter turnout happened in 2021, the response of political uh, party, of political players was, what is, the what is the Electoral Commission of South Africa doing? And um, they place the, the duty to uh, motivate people to vote on the electoral management body. I think that is a fallacy. It is a fallacy because the electoral management body is not on the ballot paper. So we, 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 our job is to make sure that um, we continuously improve our, our processes and systems so that they don't become a deterrent to a potential voter. And that is borne out, I think, by the, the, the surveys that we do, which show that the people that do actually experience voting, they rate the electoral commission very high, but those that don't have a different, um, have a different uh, perspective. Where I think there is a there is a problem is just the general participation of women in politics. Uh, as I said, uh, maybe in passing in my in in my input, I think the problem uh, is um, the the unhappiness with the political system, and uh, the fact that I think not enough scrutiny is put on political parties. There's a lot of scrutiny on the election management body as they should be. But I think um, uh, political parties and independents, wh wh whatever contestants they, they are, they are not uh, taken to task. Uh, there are comments about, oh, there's no uh, accountability, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it is 
uh, shortcoming that people ask for uh, accountability post facto as opposed to working towards accountability in, uh, in, in, in between elections. And I think um, that is the comment that uh, I'd like to offer this meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Masuku. Uh, Prof, Prof Poison. Thank you very much, Chair. Just one or two brief remarks. One comment and general question which really articulated with the case in South Africa and elections 2024 was what, what can be done to motivate voters to continue participating or to elevate their participation? Here, what I see in South Africa at this stage is a very astute, very cynical, very disillusioned electorate. And I really believe that their motivation to go out and participate can only be delivered to them in a form of action by government. Or, uh, yeah, the various political parties govern in different places. For example, there has to be concrete evidence by government that it is there in service of the people, that its representatives actually are delivering service and delivering service in a way infused with integrity because voters really see a lot of dishonesty, a lot of corruption. Perceptions of corruption in government are increasing at this stage in South Africa too. So voters will be looking for that. And what the ANC offers in return as a predominant governing party, also national level, is uh, there's a big gap between what they offer and that which think we're what voters are demanding. The ANC offers high level narratives of continuous um, disadvantagement due to the past in South Africa. Some of it is valid, some not. They try to build hope. It's really ANC as a hope factory at this stage. Hope in voters' minds that things are improving, but then ANC comes with, I believe, insufficient narratives of these a plan. They are taking steps. We, South Africa has, and government has started turning the corner. The miracle must be somewhere around the corner. So they really try to infuse that hope that they've got a plan and things will just take time. But voters have been hearing that since about 1995, when we still, when we first saw the evidence of impatience with when are the promises and where are their constitutional undertakings? Where are they and when are they going to come true? So I see a huge gap growing there with a very astute citizenry who may very well elect to vote in far lesser numbers than before, even if comparatively turnout will remain high. Thank you very much, Chair and fellow panelists. And thank you, Prof, uh, uh, for responding to those questions. Do we still have any other questions? We have one question in the Q&A box for Prof. Poison. Mm. Oh, is it? Can you, can you assist in reading that out? No problem. It says, what do you make of the, in quotes, national shutdown on Monday in projecting EFF's prospects in the 2024 elections? Okay, thank you. Over to you, Prof. <laughs> Thank you very much, and thanks for that very difficult question. You know, it, I think the shutdown or the protest cut both ways. It certainly helped elevate the EFF in national mind. I think it was effective for the EFF in terms of speaking to their own constituency and raising their own profile in a phase pre-election that's crucial to their general visibility in politics and society. And they definitely try to associate with all the predominant issues that are in voters' minds. So I think to some extent that would have been successful for the EFF. However, we also saw a big backlash against the EFF, and particularly noted by as civil society, where the EFF's original and maybe major 
mobilization orientation of threatening the alternative of violence should the shutdown, attempted shutdown or protest not be supported. So it, I don't think it's served the, the, the EFF well to have had that as part of their repertoire. And they were really seen to be stepping, taking a step back in, in when it became evident that state and government are prepared to mobilize and mobilize part of civil society, including private security companies, to quell any disruption should that happen. And I think the ANC has been quite reasonably effective in delegitimizing the action and in building the ANC's own legitimacy as being challenged unreasonably by the EFF, by the EFF as the ANC projects that wanted to disrupt and bring or further bring the economy to its knees. So, and the ANC has been very effective in the last two days to make good propaganda out of it, out of the fact that there was no shutdown and that the EFF was on some, had been on some dubious mobilizational grounds. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof, uh, for the responses. Okay, uh, I, I see we have no further questions either on the chat box or uh, uh, from the uh, from the panelists. Uh, I think Vusi, I can uh, I can safely hand over to you. Uh, to proceed to the sessions. Uh, thank, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Zaba. Thank you, Prof. Poison and um, Doc, uh, Prof. Poison and Dr. Masugu, for your insightful um, and very rich insights um, on you know the forthcoming elections, both on in Zimbabwe and in South Africa. Um, without uh, further ado and waste of time, I'm going to invite. Um, Dr. Teller from the Institute of the Future for Knowledge, uh, IFK, our partner institute, who's going to do reflections um, on, you know, what has been discussed here today. Dr. Teller, over to you. Um, good afternoon, chairs, uh, distinguished speakers and participants in South Africa and across Africa. Uh, my name is Oliver Sean Teller at the University of Johannesburg's Institute for the Future of Knowledge. In a period packed with many elections in Africa, Kenya went to the polls in late 2022. It was Nigeria's turn last month. Zimbabwe will conduct its elections later this year, while Tunisia and South Africa's elections will be held in 2024. Against this backdrop, this webinar sought to examine the electionary processes in these key countries and their implications for sustainable development in Africa. Barring Zimbabwe, these countries are regional powers. Accordingly, the results of these elections will not only influence the political trajectories of these countries, but also have wider implications for Africa and for their field. The crux of this meeting can be interpreted from the prism of two levels of analysis. First, national, second, continental. In terms of the continental message, as one of the chairs, Professor Kabele, and the speaker on Tunisia noted, it is important to examine the elections in Africa within the context of Africa's positions on critical issues, such as COVID-19 and the Russia-Ukraine crisis. It is also noted that African democracy should reflect African values and realities. At the national level, the speaker on Nigerian uh, elections noted that elections do not necessarily translate to democracy, same in how Nigeria's political parties, uh, primary elections were exclusionary and the electoral violence that characterized the presidential elections. While uh, Kenya has a multi-party system the country's democracy has been punctured by ethnicity and political violence, as political parties can be likened to ethnic associations. 
To mitigate this challenge, the speaker, the speaker called for an Africanized institutional design, most especially in the form of constitutional democracy. The speaker on Tunisia identified the rise of populist political parties and low level of political participation as the impediment to the country's um, democracy. The speaker on Zimbabwe highlighted some of the challenges expressed in the 2018 elections that are likely to manifest in the upcoming 2023 elections. Amongst others, this include a closed democratic space, a weak electoral body, as well as intolerance of opposition parties. The speakers on South Africa underscore the one-party dominant system in a multi-party democracy and argued that despite the challenges that confront the ruling African National Congress, the political party still has an edge over its competitors going into the 2024 elections. They, however, noted a declining trend in voter turnout, partly due to the alienation of the youth. From the discussion, it is clear that Africa still has a long way to go in a bid to organize free, fair, and credible elections. On behalf of the Institute for the Future of Knowledge and the Institute for Paradigm Thought and Conversation, I thank you for listening. I will now invite Busi Gumbi to give the vote of thanks. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Teller, for those um, important reflections on why we are gathered here today. Um, again, on behalf of both institutions, I'd like to thank firstly our chairs, um, our speakers who availed themselves out of the busy schedule to address us and really uh, provide rich insights on um, African elections and political processes. And I think as we depart um, here today, what is important is um, inculcating a culture of ensuring that as African citizens um, communities understand that we engage the electoral process routinely, not only after every four, five, or six years, depending on the on, on the presidential terms or administration terms, ensuring that citizens on the ground are able to engage their political leaders and familiarize themselves with the political processes and governance institutions of their respective countries. This is particularly important uh, for our democracy to, to mature and to be consolidated. Um, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, both uh, Dr. Teller and Dr. Kinola for providing us the opportunity to host this event at their respective institutions and their directors. I'd like to thank uh, the rest of the team and, uh, behind the scenes that was involved in um, making sure that this webinar becomes a success. Uh, my colleagues, Ratizo uh, Makombe, Lundawonde, my colleague at IFK, um, uh, Tandega Nomvele, and uh, the rest of the colleagues at both institutions. Thank you so much uh, for tuning in, and I appreciate um, the, the insights that were provided here today. Thank you all. Uh, Dr. Akinola, over to you, sir. Uh, thanks. And I'm, I'm just waving to everybody to say thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Uh, okay, thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. The University of Johannesburg. The future reimagined.